She's the daughter of the doctor and the writer and the guru Deepak Chopra and is a producer and partner in his production company. As you probably know, the family business is information and advice about uh, meditation, self-awareness, self-development, holistic healing, actualization, all of those good words and the object is a balanced life in which you gain some kind of distance and learn how to laugh at yourself. This is Malika Chopra. Thank you. Um, such an honor to be here. Everyone says that. Um, also a bit daunting um, because there's such incredible voices and talents. So um, thank you very much um, for having me here. I'm going to speak about intention and the power of intent um, to transform our societies and our world. Uh, but before I begin, I'm going to uh, address the question that I get asked every single day when I meet someone, which is, what is it like being Deepak Chopra's daughter? Um, and it's a funny question because my brother and I, I have one brother, uh, every time we get asked it, you know, for us, our dad's our dad. We don't really think of him as anything different. Um, we have a very close family. We do work together in bits um, on different projects. Um, and my dad, he's just, he's funny, he's very smart, he's very competitive, um, and uh, we just, we have a good time together. Um, but to understand my family, I'm going to begin um, with a story. To understand my family and my father, uh, it's important to look at my grandparents, Ma and Daddy, um, my father's parents. Um, Daddy, uh, my grandfather, was a world-renowned cardiologist in India. He was one of the first doctors um, who was trained um, at that time under the British. Um, and so uh, Daddy was actually a healer um, and looked upon by millions in India as one of the great doctors in India. But it was Ma, my grandmother, who really represented um, kind of the mythology, the spirituality, the consciousness of India, which shaped my father. Um, and Ma was very uh, confident and clear um, that she created her reality. And there are great stories about her. Um, one of which uh, took place uh, in 1958, um, post-Indian independence, when Jawaharlal Nehru, who had fought um, next to Gandhi for Indian ed independence, was coming to their town, Jabalpur, um, to visit after, um, and he was prime minister, the first prime minister of India. And um, Ma decided that when Nehru came uh, to Jabalpur, uh, he was going to leave the rose, which he wore in his um, lapel on his Nehru suit. Um, if you're familiar, uh, he used to wear a suit with a high collar, um, and he was a very distinguished man. That when Nehru came uh, to Jabalpur, he was going to take off that rose and leave it in the town. Um, and everybody said, you know, Ma, you're absolutely crazy. And she said, no, it's going to happen. Um, and so, uh, for weeks, uh, the city was planning for this visit. Ma, every day, would change her sari selection. She'd decide, I'm going to keep my hair up or down. Um, and, you know, lots of jewelry choices. Uh, and so there was a lot of planning for this meeting. <laughs> I said, you know, she's crazy. Um, but Ma said he's going to do it. Um, so the day finally came, and Nehru um, came uh, driving in a car down the street. And for those of you who have been to India, uh, you can imagine the masses of humanity that came out uh, to see one of the fathers of the Indian nation. Literally millions of people, literally. Um, and so millions of people um, on every side of the, the main road. Um, and my father, his brother, um, and my grandparents stood on the side of the road and... Um, as the car went by, uh, Nehru actually decided to get out and walk a little bit. So um, he, he walked, and he walked past my grandparents and my, uh, my, parent, my dad. Uh, and uh, about 10 paces afterwards, he stopped, he turned around, and he looked at my grandmother, who was a beautiful woman. And uh, he walked back to her, four paces back to her, looked in her eyes, took the rose from his jacket. She stood there like this and handed it to her. Ma took a deep breath, and then in a sign of victory, she lifted it up. <laughs> 
as the millions and millions of people who watched gasped, <laughs> literally gasped and cheered because that rose represented Indian independence. Ma took that rose and for the next week it stood, um, it actually she created a shrine for it. <laughs> um, and literally people would come to the house, take off their shoes and just go and look at that rose. So my grandmother was very clear that she created her reality. And if you look at my father's work, um, it's really that combination of my grandfather, who was a doctor, but my grandmother, um, who really believed in the power of consciousness and intention. So growing up, Chopra, um, my brother and I were basically the guinea pigs for all of the random experiments um, and beliefs that my dad thought. <laughs> So I started meditating when I was nine years old. My brother was five. Um, we, uh, everything from memory tricks to being hypnotized for my chocolate addiction, um, <laughs> to literally anything you can think of doing Ouija boards, um, we did it all. Um, but we were a very close family, so we had fun. Uh, so one thing, though, that my dad did do with us, which... Uh, I think has shaped my entire life, is that every morning or evening after we'd meditate, he would sit my brother and I down, and he'd ask us to repeat the following phrase, which says, I am responsible for what I see, I choose the feelings I experience, and set the goals I will achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. And after we would say that, he would ask us, what do you ask for? We'd ask for a doll, tickets to the Celtics game, um, a computer game, and my dad would listen to us, and then he would say, well, good, but what about asking for love, connection, compassion, and inspiration? So that really became the basis for growing up, is um, we were taught to basically set our intentions for our life on a daily basis um, with the belief that they would happen. And my dad's work subsequently became studying consciousness um, and showing um, the science behind um, intention as an organizing power to shape healing, um, our societies, um, but also in biology and quantum physics as well. And there's been great research done on this from people like Gary Zukov, um, Dr. Laszlo, um, the intention experiment by Lynn McTaggart. So there's a whole, my dad wrote a book called Synchro Destiny on this. So there's a whole kind of science behind this as well. So that was kind of the foundation of our upbringing. But um, for my brother and I, um, like all kids, it was very important for us to pave our own way. So when I graduated from college, I had some incredible jobs. Uh, one was to launch the Heal the World Foundation with Michael Jackson, which who I'll mention later. Um, but another job that I got um, was I actually served as the first representative for MTV in India. And I was 23 years old and I convinced MTV that I should be the person to launch this channel because my dad knew everyone there in any case. Of course, we didn't know anybody there. Um, but, uh, and so they sent, me, <laughs> they sent me to India and I lived in a hotel for months. Months. I ended up meeting my husband there and getting married. Um, but it was an absolutely incredible job. I got to do every aspect of the business from um, satellite distribution to production to marketing uh, to creating videos with no doubt. And it was the best job a 23-year-old could have because basically I got to go to every party uh, in town and I met my husband at a rave. Um, <laughs> so, so it was an amazing job. And one day, um, we had the biggest success MTV had ever had in India. We sold our first sponsorship, which was a big deal, to a big uh, multinational company. Um, and we were all celebrating and driving back to our luxury hotel in Bombay um, and basically celebrating, planning what we're going to do in the evening. And as we drove, um, as many of you who have been to Bombay, again, know, uh, you drive through slums uh, and you drive to diff through different parts of the city. So we were driving back, air-conditioned luxury car to our fancy hotel, um, and we basically got stuck in some traffic. So we wouldn't move, and um, as we looked out, we saw in front of us about 50 kids uh, kind of standing in the street. Um, and basically, they were all crowded um, in front of a small storefront shop. And our drivers beeping, etc. Um, and so we slowly kind of continue. 
Um, the kids, most of them, um, don't have clothes, none have shoes, um, really in the slums of Bombay. And as we kind of approached uh, the storefront, we looked to see what are they looking at. And there was a TV in the corner, um, and on that TV were a bunch of American kids grinding to music on a beach with the big MTV logo <laughs> right there. And everybody in my car cheered. They said, oh my God, oh my God, look at that. MTV, MTV, what an amazing day. And my heart stopped. And I thought, what am I doing? What am I doing? In that moment, I realized the power of media to change the world. And I also realized that this wasn't what I was supposed to do. So the next day, I quit my job. Um, and I've spent the last 10 years basically trying to think about how can we use media um, and you know, the messages that my father and so many great teachers uh, do portray to the world. But how can we use media to kind of reach people on a broader basis? Um, one of the things being Deepak Chopra's daughter is that everybody expects that you kind of know everything that he knows. So um, my brother and I get asked things like, uh, uh, you know, about their people's health problems or about consciousness or what happens after you die. And we make up things and people believe us and <laughs> because the name gives authority. Um, <laughs> but I think for me, I really struggled for many, many years to find my voice. Um, and for me, my voice actually came when I became a mother. Finally, um, it was so clear, uh, my voice and uh, what I was here to do. Um, I've actually written two books inspired my, by my daughters, Tara and Leela, and um, one is called 100 Promises to My Baby, which is again about setting intentions about how I want to serve as a mother. Um, so I've done a bunch of things, but my latest project is actually a website, a social media site called Intent. Um, and Intent is about basically helping people set their intentions, hopefully on a daily basis, to create the life that they want. And we shape it around well-being, um, well-being defined as personal, social, and global, um, and connect people. It's connected to Twitter and Facebook, and it reaches um, people all over the world. So it's been a great project, and I invite you to come see it. Um, since we started Intent, we've had um, some amazing experiences, and I'd like to end with another story, because this pod is about activism, and I want to talk about, again, how do we use social media um, and the media for activism. So about a year ago, uh, some of you may remember um, Laura Ling and Yuna Lee, who were two reporters who were detained in North Korea, and eventually actually um, sentenced to hard labor. Um, and, you know, they had supposedly crossed the Chinese border. Well, Laura is actually my brother's best friend. Um, my brother hired Laura into that job, um, and my brother actually started current TV with Al Gore. So when this happened, we went into complete panic mode um, because this was a very serious international situation because North Korea, um, there was, there's also a lot of tension with the U.S. The Ling family had actually been asked um, by the U.S. State Department uh, to basically sit in the background um, and not while well, the State Department tried to negotiate. But the Ling family came to my brother and I and said, you know, we don't want people to forget about these stories. They've kind of got lost in, in God knows what, where behind the Iron Curtain. Um, and so my brother and I took to blogging and Twitter and Facebook and a bunch of other friends, and we basically just kept talking about it. Um, we told stories about Laura. I became very close to Yuna's family. Um, she has a four-year-old daughter, and I had a four-year-old daughter, and so I could relate to Yuna, um, who was a mother in captivity. In fact, I wrote a blog that got picked up um, everywhere um, about being a mother in captivity, because Yuna, in her um, one phone call that she got to her husband, um, told her husband that, um, don't forget to sign her up for camp, because the, red, the deadline <laughs> is on Monday. So, you know, being a mother is still in captivity. So I wrote um, a bunch of blogs about that, and, you know, it, it, we worked tirelessly to just keep the story out there. And what's amazing about media is you can do that today. You can kind of just write, use Twitter, use Facebook, use any connection you have to get stories out there. Well, we kept trying. Um, didn't look like too much was happening. 
And Gotham, my brother, um, was very close to Michael Jackson. Um, and uh, this is, Michael was still alive at the time. And so Gotham um, was talking to Michael. And Michael said, you know, I've been hearing about your friend. And, uh, you know, I wish, is there anything I can do to help? And Gotham said, you know, Michael, we're doing everything we can. Yeah, it's a very stressful situation. And so Michael was silent on the other side of the phone for a while. And then he said, you know, Gotham, maybe their leader um, is a fan of mine. And uh, Gotham said, yeah, Michael, you know, everyone, everybody knows who you are. And he said, no, no, I think he's obsessed with me because you know how he dresses in all that military <laughs> garb? <laughs> I think he totally copies me. <laughs> so, so Gotham laughed at Michael's sweetness and naivete. Um, and he said, yeah, maybe. Well, two weeks later, Michael died, very tragically. Um, and so Gotham decided that he was going to share that story about Michael Jackson, um, you know, and he wrote a blog about it. Well, the blog, of course, immediately got picked up everywhere because people were obsessed with Michael Jackson news, and we were on the cover of every um, magazine, newspaper worldwide. Uh, and um, Larry King called Gotham. He went on Larry King to talk about it. So suddenly, the story of Michael Jackson wanting to help out uh, Laura Ling and Yuna Lee had hit international news. Well, Laura and Yuna, of course, had a fairy tale kind of uh, rescue where Bill Clinton flew to North Korea to bring them back. And when Laura returned uh, to home, she called Gotham and she said, you won't believe it. My guard used to come to me and say, did you know that Michael Jackson is trying to get you rescued? <laughs> <laughs> and so again, it showed to us the incredible power of media today to reach every single corner of our universe. Um, and so that's what we've been trying to do with intent. Um, and we've had some amazing experiences. So I just want to stress that anybody today can really use the tools that we have in modern society to make a change and to make a difference. So before I end, I'd like to ask you to close your eyes. Take a deep breath and think about what is your intent for yourself, for your community, and for Mother Earth. Please open your eyes. So if I have one idea, from this conference, it's let's create a movement of positive intents, aspirations to heal ourselves, our societies, and precious Mother Earth. Thank you. <laughs>